Tim, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening, I review all of the awesome watches we missed last week while fixated on Rolex. We chat live and review your viewer-submitted wrist shots. All that tonight on Watches Tonight. Check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. Open a different window, keep me streaming. Over 3,000 late model pre-owned and vintage watches available right now. You are guaranteed to find the watch you want. Okay, viewer wrist shots number one. I asked, you answered, and boy did you ever. Yukai of Hong Kong overlooks the city streets with his AP Royal Oak chronograph. We have Jeff R. of Texas who lights up the beach in Cancun with his Rolex GMT white gold meteorite dial. Very nice. Rick R. of Chicago and his Alonga Unzona double split are out for dinner in the American Midwest and it looks like they're going with some Chicago style deep dish. We got JCS who impresses with the much loved previous generation, Brigade Marine and Stainless Steel. And Dave E. combines high performance machines with Mercedes Benz AMG and Front. Francois Paul Jorn with the Chronograph Monopoussoir Line Sport. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on this box. All right, let's see who's in the chat box. Speaking of which, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Matt Foster, Enrique Cassiano, Richard Combs from South Florida, Jim Millet, Matteo C, Scott W from Westchester. We've got Baltimore Spirits, guess where he's from. Alex O, Ethan Davis, Soma joining in. We've got B&W, Miroslav. We've got Han, or Hanis uh, joining in from Prague. We've got Art Chameleons asking, what is replacing the Zin? Uh, well, nothing yet. I'm wearing my System 51. So this is, this is a robot-built plastic mechanical swatch watch. But there will be something, hopefully news soon. I have something specific in mind. Also, it's fun to be back in the market after so long not shopping for watches. This is a good time. We have Kara joining and asking, what do you think of the more cowbell sketch from Saturday Night Live? Wow, that is out of left field. Well, I'm a huge fan of the Blue Oyster Cult, so I like the fact that they popped up on you know, the modern pop culture radar at least a decade after their prominence in the 80s and 70s. But I mean, goodness, has it been 20 years since that skit already? Uh, I think it's funny, but I, I kind of wish that they would spoof some other Blue Oyster Cult songs because they've got a great catalog. And now everyone just knows the Blue Oyster Cult from that skit in this era. Okay, we have a question. Tim, what is your forever watch for under $10,000? Well, it was my Zin, and that was kind of my plan, and I was sticking with that answer. But I would say something like an MIH watch or maybe a Zenith Captain Windsor annual calendar with El Primero chronograph and the smoked Palladium boutique edition dial. I would also say, oh, we've got a prediction that I will be wearing De Batoon soon. Uh, that would be awfully nice. We've got Danny S. joining in from Washington, D.C. And we've got Sincon joining in from London, staying up late with us. We got Tariq, we got Thomas, we got S&P and Alexi Simola of Finland joining in. We got Brady P. from California and Miguel from Albuquerque, New Mexico. All right, guys, we'll have some more time to chat. But first, let's take a look at Watches and Wonders 2022. Watches and Wonders 2022 has come and gone, and amid the obsession with Rolex, Tudor, and Patek Philippe, we managed to overlook some of the best stuff. The biggest new model event of the year was Watches and Wonders 2022, so we only focused on three brands and a couple of standout watches from those brands. What did we miss? Well, we missed complications, haute horlogerie, limited editions, independent brands, all of this flying under the radar because of a green nine o'clock crown GMT. So I'm going to talk about the fun stuff that we didn't cover last week here on Watchbox Studios, the stuff that I would actually like to buy, starting with the most elaborate version yet of a surprising success in the sports watch segment, and that is the Chopard Alpine Eagle Flying Tourbillon. Now, when the Alpine Eagle came out in 2019, there was a lot of skepticism. Some folks noted its resemblance to better-known integrated bracelet sports watches, or asked why Chopard was resurrecting the obscure 1980 Saint Moritz design, or even asked, I mean, it's comical now, even asked whether 2019 was too late in the game to start selling an integrated bracelet steel sports watch. Well, the Alpine Eagle had the last laugh, and it's now highly regarded and a great value at right about $13,000 for what you could easily pay three or four times as much to buy from another brand. But with the Flying Tourbillon, they are going upscale. Uh, this is, of course, 
an answer to a watch that launched almost simultaneously, because you might have seen that just in the last few days, AP launched its own Royal Oak Flying Tourbillon Extra Thin, which is basically the 2022 Jumbo 16202, but with a flying tourbillon added. And that watch starts at 185,000 US dollars for the steel model. No offense, AP, but I want the show part instead. First of all, there's a lot to recommend it. We'll start with the case back. This watch is mind-blowing, micro rotor, so though it's automatic with the convenience that entails, nothing is blocked, you can see all. Over the last few years, uh, the Louis Ulysse Chopard manufacture movements have expanded to mass production from their once exclusive use of haute horlogerie finish. Here you can see that this watch, this movement, absolutely breathtaking. This is Geneva Hallmark, and at the same time, it's also COSC certified Swiss chronometer. So it is a double certification movement, constructed entirely in-house. It's absolutely brilliant, both in architecture and finish. Remember, architecture is the shape of the pieces and how they're arranged. Finish is how they're actually polished, satinated, striped, or perlaged. It's two different things, and this movement has both. It's gorgeous, and it's a micro rotor with a 65 hour power reserve to the AP's 50 hours, and the AP caliber, frankly, looks austere by comparison. Dial detail on this Alpine Eagle, as with the rest of the line, is world class and a lot more interesting than the rather rote AP hobnail, which at this point is starting to feel a little bit perfunctory by comparison. The 41 millimeter Chopard actually beats the extra thin AP at eight millimeters thick to the AP's 8.1. That's what a micro rotor can do for you. The Alpine Eagle also boasts, as with the standard model, 100 meter water resistance to the AP's 50 meters and the Chopard can be had for 112,000 US dollars. So not only is it a more capable watch in many regards, but it is a far more affordable watch. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box. We got a lot of friends joining in, a couple from London. We got Joe Pinto joining in from Florida instead of Louisville this time. We've got Karum asking, uh, oh no, joining in from Birmingham, England. So Karam is joining in from the ancestral home of Black Sabbath, one of my favorite bands. So Edward Ledden saying, the JLC was my favorite of all the brands this year. They did have a very cool Polaris Perpetual Calendar, which is a neat watch. It's not on my list tonight, but we can talk about it a bit. If you like gradient dials, grained dials with a sandpaper texture, if you like dive watches with internal rotating bezels, if you like full bracelet sports watches with bracelet quick release lugs, if you like 70 hour power reserves instead of 38, 40, or 42, you're going to like this new JLC perpetual calendar, which uses the long established IWC Kurt Klaus system, so it's mechanically programmed. Index the calendar, everything moves in sync. It is a very nice watch and it's well loomed. It could be my next watch, who knows? It's got all the things I like. Durability, JLC, perpetual calendar. Hmm, maybe I'm more interested than I thought. We have friends joining in from Manchester, Gavin W. And we have Gamby joining in from Atlanta. And we've got Steve M joining in along with Anthony saying I don't care about brand cachet. And that's true. I mostly just buy what I want. I very rarely follow the pack. Unless of course it's the pack in our chat box a group of connoisseurs with exquisite and discriminating tastes. We've got Andre from Norway, and we've got Abdul saying that JLC Polaris is awesome as Watch's Journey joins us from the Netherlands and Mark joins in from Washington, D.C. All right, let's talk about another nerd brand. We talked about JLC, we talked about Chopard. Now let's talk about Ulysse Nardin. Celebrating its newfound independence from the Caring Group, UN is back where it was during the Rolf Schneider era an independently owned, independently acting brand that is owned by its management. So Ulysse Nardin arrived in Geneva ready to make a statement about its future as an independent, and that statement was the Freak S, an absolutely stunning take on the now 21-year-old Ulysse Nardin icon. Uh, this is the first time UN signature carousel tourbillon watch includes two separate balances and escapements, and you can see them right there. They're opposed at 20 degrees from the horizontal, so that relative to gravity, they will always err by opposite amounts. They are then equalized 
Both of these regulators feature free-sprung balances. They feature proprietary anti-magnetic silicon hairsprings. You can see that the balances are made of silicon as well as rose gold masses. And Ulysse Norden, through its subsidiary Sigatech, makes its own silicon. It's one of the few companies in the business that does not need to purchase this high-tech material from an external contractor. So they're very impressive because each escapement is unlubricated. That's right, it's not just the balance and the hairspring, it's also the escapement itself, which is made of silicon and then coated with synthetic diamond so that it never needs to be lubricated. It uses what they call diamond sill, a UN proprietary technology. The hairspring, again, anti-magnetic and free sprung, but let's talk about that differential because this is where the magic happens. You can see it's a vertical differential, much like what you find in the axle of an automobile. And it has a very specific purpose. The differential advertises that it can even out the disparate effects of the two different escapements and balances. So what you get here is an averaging of the two to equalize their error in an opposite manner and create the truest timekeeping possible. Now this is a system we've seen in the past on watches from, for example, Grubel Forsey, but now we're getting that high horology in a carousel tourbillon with a degree of materials technology in the silicon that frankly even Grubel Forsey hasn't achieved in-house. So. Automatic winding, a system first previewed in the 2017 InnoVision concept, here is provided in the form of the grinder. No, it's not what you're thinking. It is an automatic winding system that is extraordinarily shock protected and efficient, and it operates by energizing a 72-hour power reserve. Take note, freak fans, this is no freak with a crown. You can still wind the watch manually using the case back. The Freak S displays time in a fashion that is consistent with past Freak watches, which is to say you have a carousel, which is similar to a tourbillon, but more robust, and it acts as the hour hand. With a carousel, you have a different drive system for the escapements and for the carriage. And what happens is you can actually move the carriage around without crashing the escapement. And that is integral to the concept of the Freak because this baguette movement, which has everything except the power supply built into the minute hand, uh, it is effectively a mobile movement. Now it's also impressive to note that you have an aventurine disc underneath, which is attached directly to the top of the mainspring barrel, which is in the case back. So the mainspring barrel moves moves at the same speed as a 12-hour hand. So that aventurine glass disc doubles as the hour hand and it is directly attached to the mainspring barrel. Uh, this is an incredibly impressive feat of technological innovation, but also artistry. Basic specs include the following details. It is a large 45 millimeter watch made of a combination of sapphire, rose gold, ceramic, and grade five titanium. An initial run of 75 pieces will be made in this rose gold medley. However, only 40 of them will be made for sale this year. So expect 40 of these to be available this year through Ulysse Norden distributors with 75 in this variant to be offered ultimately. Expect that there will be other metals, which can include white gold, yellow gold, titanium, and platinum. Don't rule out carbon fiber or ceramic because this is Ulysse Norden and they've done it in the past. There is is a lock at the base of the dial. So if you're familiar with every Freak ever issued except the Freak X with the crown and the first Freak which had no bezel lock, you lift that little lock and that allows you to turn the bezel which is how you set the watch moving the minute and the hour hand by turning the bezel clockwise or counterclockwise. And despite the grinder, remember once again you can still wind it. It's a wonderful piece of theater to take your watch off your wrist at a dinner and wind it with the the case back and set it with the bezel. It makes devotees of your otherwise watch agnostic dinner companions. Now the beat rate is a handsome and traditional 18,000 vibrations per hour for both of the escapements. So it's got a nice steady beat to it. But remember, it has two heartbeats. So against
against the ear, it's going to have a wonderful syncopation that you can't get even with a tourbillon watch. I should also mention that it's 30 meters water resistant, which may not sound like a lot, but remember prior to 2013, no freaks were ever water resistant. No photos were provided, but apparently the dial includes loom. So if you look at the minute hand tip as well as the hour hand on the disc below, yes, it's loomed and yes, you can see it at night. Last year was the 20th anniversary for the Freak, Ulysse Norden's most important model ever, and one of the most influential watches, both in technology and design, in the 21st century. Frankly, the Freak S feels like a 20th anniversary watch that, for whatever reason, budget, the sale of the company, or technological constraints got delayed a year. And I really do believe that this was probably intended as the 20th anniversary freak and it got delayed. Well, it was worth the wait. This is a contender for best in show from Watches and Wonders 2022, and it might be my all-around favorite watch in the exhibition. I'm not sure anyone, including the Haute Horlogerie Independence, actually did better this year. At $137,200, it will be worth every penny. Okay, let's take a look. Viewer wrist shots number two. I asked, you answered, and how? Fadi Y of Jerusalem enjoys a Cabernet Sauvignon on his porch with his Omega Constellation Globemaster, enjoying that Mediterranean climate with one of Omega's best watches. John D. of Long Island keeps the time with the latest Rolex Datejust on Jubilee bracelet with his furry friend in the background. Captain Emilio, a police captain retired from the Torrance California Police Department showcases his Rado Captain Cook and his Volkswagen Jetta. We love our uniformed personnel here. Alex with watches rides in his JDM, that is Japanese domestic market, Omega Speedmaster date automatic looking good behind the wheel, and Paul S. shares the Dewis M3W wandering hours watch from the frigid Swiss Alps. April is still very much ski season in the Alps. More on that in a moment, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. All right, Watches and Wonders 22. So much more than Tudor, Rolex, and Patek. Vacheron Constantin had a solid, if not spectacular, year with a few standout launches, of which one simply bestrides the show like a colossus. We've been asking for years, Vacheron has answered, because everyone is talking about the Historique 222. Uh, this is without a doubt the top vintage tribute watch of the year from anybody at any price. And it might be the best Vacheron Historique series entry since the pioneering retro watch collection was introduced in the late 1980s. Vacheron was one of the very first to reissue fabled previous models. So along with the Patek Philippe Nautilus 3700, the Audemars Piguet 5402 Jumbo, the IWC Jumbo Ingenieur 1832, the Vacheron 222 was part of that class considered to be the most important luxury sports watch designs of the integrated bracelet era of the 1970s. So Vacheron teased this a few years in advance as at least in 2019 and possibly 2018 they were rolling out their museum their company museum collection model 222 at a traveling exhibition of Vacheron sports watches that included every generation of the overseas and they included the 222 with that collection heavily hinting that some sort of reissue was going to come and the only real question was whether or not the reissue would be part of the overseas line or it would be properly part of the Historique collection. Frankly, both would have made sense. Well, here we have it, and the answer is that it is part of the Historique collection, along with milestone watches like the Corn de Vache 1955, the Extra Plot 1955, the American 1921. All of these watches now share space on Vacheron's website with this. But what are you getting? Well, you're getting a 222 in yellow gold, uh, which precisely recreates the Jorg Heisig design of 1977 down to the size, proportions, and case details. They even include a little white gold Vacheron Maltese cross, though somewhat confusingly in some of the tech specs that have been issued, they're calling it a palladium 
Maltese cross. So it's one or the other, but it's there, just as it was on the original, along with a bezel and a case and a bracelet that directly inspired the original Dino Modolo and Vincent Kaufman designed 1996 overseas automatic. So this watch, side by side, is frankly impossible to distinguish from the old 222. So they played this one close. At 37 millimeters in diameter by 7.9 millimeters thick, this watch wears exactly like the vintage piece, but frankly with a better bracelet. As with most long-running Historique series watches, expect this one to be replaced by different metal offerings over the life of the model. So I expect that yellow gold will be followed by rose gold. There may be additions in white gold and platinum, as well as a very very real possibility of seeing two-tone steel gold and stainless steel. Remember, the original 222 was issued in three different variants. More on that in a moment. But if we take the Corn de Vache chronograph as an example, in 2015 they came out with the platinum model. Then in 2016, they came out with a rose gold model. They came out with the Hodinkee Steel Limited Edition in 2018. And then in 2019, they came out with a full-time version in stainless steel that was a regular offering in the catalog. And I expect the 222 will follow the same product arc as it advances towards eventual discontinuation. So the original 1977 to 1985 model 222 was made in approximately 500 examples in steel. 120 to 150 examples in yellow gold and 100 to 120 examples in yellow gold and steel. And I would be very surprised if we don't wind up seeing a version of each in this current revival. While I expect Vacheron to make more of these than they made from 77 to 1985, I don't expect them to make much more. So I don't think this model will dilute either itself or the original over time. I expect these will always be scarce. And Vacheron pleasantly surprised me, but I also suspect that they're going to force you to buy a bunch of dress watches you don't want when you walk into the boutique and ask if they have this available. All right. All praise is well deserved, but Vacheron did make one big mistake with this watch, and that was leaving the old JLC-based Vacheron Caliber 1120 out of the new watch. You could see it there, it's beautiful, it's historically true to the original, and the Vacheron Caliber 2455 on the new 222 isn't as handsome as the old movement, and it offers only minor practical improvements over the original, like hacking and a quick set date, things I can live without. The 1120 was used on the original 222, the first Nautilus and the first Royal Oak. So placing it in the Historique 222 would have created a true re-edition on every level from the case to the movement. Vacheron has used the 1120 in the 2016 Overseas Ultra Thin, which I thought was sort of a tribute in spirit to the original 222, but that Overseas Ultra Thin of 2016 used the 1120. It was white gold, ultra thin, no date, it was basically an overseas jumbo, and they made fewer than 100. I think this will someday be the most valuable Vacheron sports watch, yes, including the original 222. And I would have loved if it had shared a movement with the new 222, but the fact that the new 2 doesn't means this thing is just going to be worth that much more down the line. Nevertheless, Vacheron will sell every single one of the new 222s in yellow gold at its retail price of $62,500 US dollars. Okay, let's see what you guys are saying right here. Mike Dixon would love a 222 in 40 to 42 millimeters. That exists. It's called the overseas self-winding. <laughs> what else is going on in the box right here? We have Thrifty Mr. Chris saying, I would order a 56 blue dial steel bracelet, order leather at the same time. That would be his choice in sporty Vacherons. Abdul saying, I really respect VC for the exact reissue of the 222. They made it right. And then we got Love for Watches PT saying, imagine a VC 222 in platinum. That will be a very special watch when, and yes, I'm saying when it happens. Davey85 saying, very cool of VC to drop this. Why not take advantage of the classic? And we have Thomas Burnett saying, shout out, he loved the titanium 250 piece limited edition Longa Odysseus 2. All right, what else is going on in the chat box? We have 
Delay asking, Tim, is the third party movement in the base VC56 a letdown or no big deal? I think no big deal. If you buy one of those used, you're getting a very fair price for what it is. I think it's a nice watch. It's well made. The custom rotor adds some value. But I'll also say this. Every other version of the 56 has a Vacheron movement with Geneva Hallmark. So just you know, get the used triple calendar in steel. Just buy it used. And uh, also, frankly, consider getting a stainless steel Catalil because that was a Geneva Hallmark watch in a steel case at an entry level for Vacheron, and they're hugely undervalued right now. Remember, the last model year of the Catalil was 100 meters water resistant, loomed, and stainless steel. So that's a real sports watch. If you can deal with the size of the case, that is the steel entry level Vacheron to get. Danny asking, Tim, do you think it is cheap that Rolex didn't leave the date window on the right side of the GMT? No, I actually think they made a deliberate decision to do it the way they did it, because every other lefty is built like that with the crown on the 9 o'clock side and the date on the 3 o'clock side, and that includes Tudor. So I honestly believe that Rolex made a decision. I don't think it's because Rolex lacks the competence or the resources to put the data on the other side. I think they just made a decision to do it the way they did, and frankly, I'm glad they did because it's less generic as a result. All right. This is a watch I debated including, but let me give you a little bit of context. In 2016, Vacheron updated its long-running Traditionnel perpetual calendar chronograph with a new dial, an upgraded movement, and a larger 43 millimeter case. And for 2022, we get a new variant with a salmon dial and a platinum case. Now here's why I debated including this. It is gorgeous, but it's not very original, because in the last three years, we've seen Patek do this back in 2018 and Langa do it in 2019. So this is a well-established trope in contemporary watch design. But the 2022 VC TPCC, it's one hell of a name, is a great looking watch with the traditional Lemagne based chronograph caliber that warms the hearts of watch fans and which you cannot get anymore in a Patek Philippe. Modified is VC caliber 1142 QP. It's a perpetual calendar, it's a column wheel chronograph, but they modify it. It gains an overcoil hairspring, a higher beat rate, Geneva Hallmark finish, and yes, a free sprung Gyromax style balance. So there is a lot to love. Pardon me, it's free sprung, but not Gyromax style. So one nice touch on this 2022 model is the moon phase disc, which in addition to the traditionally melancholy moon face on the phase, is made of platinum, which I adore. Little details count. The 43 millimeter platinum ingot of a watch is broad, but at 12.9 millimeters thick, it's fairly flat, which is admirable. Pricing has not been announced, but availability will be exclusive to Vacheron factory boutiques. And remember, this one in platinum is going to be hefty. It's going to be like a little platinum hockey puck on your wrist. Okay, viewer wrist shots. I asked you answered your wrist on my list. And here we go, starting with Will C. The Alps again. Now in the French Alps, hitting the slopes with his Rolex Milgauss Z Blue. Perhaps I'll add one of those to my collection. Bogdan I of Romania. Rides his Vespa GTS with the Tudor Black Bay 58. Looking good, Bogdan. Andre G honors his World War II great uncle Russ, who flew Spitfires, by having an IWC Pilot's Watch chrono engraved in his name and marked with a posthumous Distinguished Flying Cross and Unit designation. Phil C. and Dad mark Sr.'s 56th birthday with a pair of exquisite Rolex Daytonas. Mark D. of South Florida enjoys heavy metal with platinum Rolex Daydate with the now discontinued conical bezel and his BMW M760i. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see how many viewers we have right now. 283. Guys, let's get that number up over 300. Stay with me. Great stuff is coming. Let's get that number to 300 concurrent viewers. All right, chat box. What's going on? Dr. Stu saying the new TPCC would have been phenomenal if less than 43 millimeters. And I kind of agree with you there. There's also a bit of a, a symmetry between the size of the movement and the case. And you can see that in how closely spaced the dial indicators are. Ira Wolf saying the new AK is a winner for me. Thinner, oyster lock, 70 hours, crown guards, 05. It's 
which means 05 at five minutes on the dial. It's now better balanced and a practical weekend watch, a great 40 millimeter alternative to the Explorer 36. That is true, it no longer seems like a cheaper Milgauss clone or a bigger, more expensive Explorer clone. I think they did a good job of setting it apart but at the same time, that raises my expectations for the Milgauss redesign when it comes. They really need to use a honeycomb dial and a rotating bezel to set it apart. And frankly, no guards on the Milgauss. What else is going on? Yankees and Giants, a fan of both AL and NL leagues, saying the only Rolex I would wear is the Milgauss. What else is going on in the box? We got Abdul saying, should the small watch trend catch up with these complications. I think to a large degree it already is. We're seeing smaller watches across the board. Remember that Vacheron is using a case from a few years back. Lucy and D joining from Bucharest. Thank you so much for staying up late with me in continental Europe. Let's get that 300 concurrent viewers. All right, Watches and Wonders 2022, so much more than Patek Philippe. There are two levels. Now we're talking about a real nerd watch, my favorite watch in the show, and a watch I am very, very seriously considering purchasing. There are two levels of Mont Blanc watch. The first Mont Blanc watches were launched in 1997, and at first they were not impressive. But through the 2000s, Richemont invested obsessively because Mont Blanc is independently managing within Richemont the way, for example, Cartier manages itself, the way Bulgari manages itself within LVMH. Mont Blanc is a superpower. No one tells them how to invest in their watches or what to produce. So at the first level, they've built up capacity in La Loque, where they have their primary factory, which can turn out up to 100,000 watches a year. And those are watches that look like and are priced like this new 2022-1858 Iced Sea Automatic Diver. Affordable, mass production, luxury, but mass production. Second, and this is where things get cool, we have the Minerva-built Mont Blanc watches which are hand-built in Villaray and amount to a few hundred pieces per year. This part of Mont Blanc is run like a high-end independent, and those watches from Minerva look like this 2022-1858 Minerva Monopusher Chronograph Red Arrow. Let me explain. This is a stainless steel 42 millimeter sports chronograph inspired by Minerva Villaray aviators chronographs of the 1920s and mobile timing bezels of the 1930s. A sports-oriented dial includes copious loom, a bi-directional rotating red arrow, the timing bezel, a telemeter scale for measuring distance, and a tachymeter scale in snailed form for measuring speed. And critically, this isn't a huge precious metal dress watch like most previous Mont Blanc Villaray chronographs shown here at 44 millimeters in rose gold. Those were great watches, but it was like wearing a pocket watch on your wrist because early versions of the Mont Blanc Minerva chronographs used converted pocket watch chronograph calibers. So you buy a Minerva Mont Blanc for the movement, which includes blinding finish that will leave you wiping the sweat off your forehead. This makes VC's work on that salmon dial chronograph look like a bomb and Mercier. And yes, it's exactly as good as it looks. Now here's the caliber 1321 that's used in the new Red Arrow. And it's just like the 1909 that you saw in the previous image, but the 1321 is designed for use in smaller cases. No expense is spared, it's just smaller. Features include a 60 hour power reserve, column wheel chronograph with lateral clutch, an aesthetically gorgeous 18K beat rate, an overcoil hairspring. Everything about this watch is straight out of 1920s haute horlogerie watch making. And in fact, that 1321 nomenclature refers to things like the size in French lean and the year that the basic architecture was created. So it is extremely traditional. Is it as good as Patek Philippe? I would say yes maybe even better. If you go back to old Le Mania finished a Bausch in watches like the 3970, 5970, and 5070, I've seen a lot of those firsthand, and I think this is better. All right, this is a watch 
that walks the walk and talks the talk, as it has been through 500 hours of durability, power reserve, and chronometric testing at Mont Blanc before it reaches the customer. So this is not just a beautiful movement, it works the way a watch should. It is accurate and precise and it keeps the time. And remember, accuracy and precision are not the same thing. This is both. Now the gorgeous double scale chronograph is the watch I would most like to own from Watches and Wonders 2022. Now I'm still looking at some of the indie launches around the margins and we will see more new watches this year. We will see more new watches launched all year this year than we have ever seen launched all year in the past. But this is my leading candidate to be my next high horology watch. It's the one I want most from Geneva this year and at $30,500 the price seems downright reasonable for what you get. But a limited production run of 88 pieces is going to keep it special and keep it exclusive. All right, we got Joe M joining in from New York City. Danny S asking, do Mont Blanc watches hold their value or is it better to buy used? Used. What else is going on right here? Sympathy for the bezel saying, met Richard Meal at the 12 hours of Sebring. I was shocked to see a guy like that in Sebring, Florida of all places. Don't be. He's part of the FIA's Endurance Racing Committee and WEC, which is a major FIA series, did a double event this year with the Sebring 12 Hours. They called it Super Sebring. So RM himself, not the brand, the man, is part of the endurance racing committees that helps to set the standards for WEC and races like the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which are raced under WEC standards and WEC rules. And remember now, we're gonna be seeing a lot of crossover with the classes like GT3, LMP2, and LMDH from IMSA, that's the 12 Hours of Sebring, those cars are now going to be eligible to race at Le Mans and in WEC and during the Sebring 1000, which is a WEC event. So it makes a lot of sense that Richard Mille would be there. He genuinely loves cars. It is not just a lifestyle flourish. It's not an accessory. He is like me. He goes home and when he's done with a busy day, He's on Bring a Trailer, he's on the web forums, he's actually reading the news on dailysportscar.com. He is a lifer in endurance racing and motorsports. It is not just the image. The guy is genuinely into it. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. Two years ago, Grand Seiko launched a rare concept movement that notably had no associated watch with it. It was just a movement and a concept, like a concept car. The T0 Constant Force Tourbillon was a two-barrel tourbillon with a remontoir constant force device on a carriage inside of a which was mounted a tourbillon so it's a coaxial remontoir and tourbillon chronometry was the goal now the kodo constant force tourbillon named after the japanese word for heartbeat in the SLGT003 model brings the T0 movement to market in a 20-piece limited edition. Each example is hand-built, hand-finished, and priced accordingly at $350,000. The watch measures 43.8 millimeters in diameter in platinum and grade 5 titanium. The cage bearing the tourbillon also acts as the coaxial remontoir. So the remontoir takes in one second bursts of energy and then transfers that spring energy to the tourbillon at center. So the two barrels don't directly drive the tourbillon carriage. Instead, it maintains constant amplitude via constant force for the first 50 hours of the watch's frankly impressive 72 hour power reserve. And yes, because it jumps every second, the Raymontoir doubles as a deadbeat seconds system. Now, each Kodo movement endures 34 days of testing in all six standard positions, and each example receives a certificate that outlines the specific performance of the movement during the test. Accuracy is said to be plus five, minus one second per day or better on the wrist, not static like a chronometer test, but actually worn on the wrist. And shockingly for this type of watch, water resistance is rated at 100 meters. Despite the focus on technology, all finishing on the watch is executed to the absolute height of ambition, and skeletonized construction means there is no place for crudity to hide. All parts are on display at all times, and they are beautifully executed. Guys, 20 people need to step up and prove that we believe in haute horlogerie, Japanese watchmaking, that this is the equal of anything from Langa Patek and Vacheron, or for that matter, Grubel Forsey. And yes, I hold it in that level of esteem. 
and I hold you guys in esteem. Viewer wrist shots number four, Lawrence L gets us started. He's out of Vancouver, he's got this black and white shot of his rare Armenstrom gravity equal force. A cool watch from an underrated indie. Dylan L and his Tudor Pelagos hit the road in his BMW. Looking good. Andy H and his watch box bought Rolex Daytona two-tone prepared to drive his route in the school box. Andy, thank you for trusting our company. Alex O submits his wife's wrist shot as she wears an Ox und Junior limited edition. William L. drives his Tesla Model Y with the latest Rolex Datejust 36 in two-tone with laser cut dial. And Fahed F. of Dubai takes us home with the JLC Reverso Tribute 90th Anniversary. Guys, thank you so much. That is our show. Let me know in the chat below what were your favorite new watches of Watches and Wonders, and if not from the show, what have been your favorite new watches from 2022? If you haven't seen something you like, what would you like to see? Subscribe. Thanks for logging on. Thanks to Sean. He makes the magic happen. Time out. Tim out. Thanks for logging on. Be well. Have fun.